What does life hold for philosophy majors? I decided to find out. Welcome to Life After Philosophy. I'm Christopher Annadale. Welcome to Life After Philosophy. My guest today is Dr. John Paul Heil. He is presently a core fellow here at Mount St. Mary's University. He's my colleague. He completed his philosophy studies at the Mount in 2015 as part of a triple major in philosophy, history, and Italian studies with a minor in English. So a true Renaissance man and a humanities man after my own heart. He completed his MA in history at the University of Chicago in 2016 and his PhD in history with distinction in 2022. He is presently pursuing an MTS, that's a Master of Theological Studies, in Biotechnology and Ethics at the Pontifical John Paul II Institute. And he is a good friend of mine. John Paul, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Chris. It's a pleasure to be here. So the, the theme of the show is Life After Philosophy, and here you are now, nine years post-philosophy plus yep. major. And you've been through grad school, you've completed a doctorate degree, and sort of the, that's, that's the peak, that's the pinnacle, the golden ring, and here you are back at the Mount teaching undergraduates. What's the adventure been like, and what's, what's been the role of philosophy in it, looking back on it now? Well, this is, uh, I mean, not to per part the curtain for your audience too much, but when you had asked me, like, okay, think about, like, how philosophy has influenced your life between sort of the end of your time here and, and now, I was like, I really cannot, like, I would not be here if I had not done the philosophy major at the Mount. Is like, that right? philosophy has been every step of the way. Um, so when I was here at the Mount, like, I came in, as a, as a philosophy major, I knew that I wanted to do it from like the beginning. At the time, I was uh, discerning the priesthood pretty seriously, and so I sort of went into it with the mentality of, okay, I'm going to go in and get my philosophy degree, and then hopefully when I graduate, shave a couple years off the, the seminary time. And then over the course of my time here in undergrad, discerned that, you know, fatherhood is great, mm -hmm. but sort of, you know, biological fatherhood rather than spiritual fatherhood. Um, now, you, you were always in the undergraduate program. You weren't a seminarian, just, just to be clear for people who are not Indeed, yes. clear about the distinction. Yeah, Those yeah. are two entirely separate programs. Yes. Yeah, I was an undergraduate. Um, and yeah, over, over the course of my time at the Mount, um, it, in large part because of the classes I uh, took and the teachers that I encountered, many of whom have like very, very strong families, mm -hmm. right, and flourishing families, uh, really just discerned that like this was um, the the that marriage and family was the right track for me, and so that meant that like I was taking all these philosophy classes, but now there was sort of you know no, there was no like um, greater sort of quote unquote purpose at the end of it, right? I was just taking these classes for the for their own end, right? And I was like. And this is awesome, right? It's like, these classes are amazing. Um, I remember taking my first logic class with Thay Neighborhaus, who's a colleague here at the philosophy department. And this was, uh, this was my sort of like intro to like philosophy and just having my mind blown by how many fallacies like happen, just took place in like normal everyday conversation. Mm -hmm. And I was taking that at the same time as like my first ancient philosophy class and reading Plato for the first time, who's been extremely influential in my doctoral work um, and uh, Plato and Aristotle and really just like loving every minute of it. Mm -hmm. uh, and one of the things that I sort of realized when I went to, so in my junior year, I went to Florence to study abroad and I was already sort of interested in doing Italian stuff. Um, and one of our other colleagues here just convinced me to become a history major. And I was like, I would really love to explore, like, I mean, A, I knew being in Florence for the first time, I never want to do anything else, right? Oh, yeah. Italy is amazing. Mm -hmm. Like, I had colleagues at U the University of Chicago who would, like, you know, who were studying, like, Siberian history and got all these grants to, like, go and study in Siberia. I'm like, you freaks. <laughs> like, this is, there's no way I would ever do that. But so, anyway, now I, like, get grants and I can go and study in Italy. What a, what a horrible, sad life this is. Oh, my gosh. But anyway, yeah, so I, I, when I went to Florence for the first time, I, like, encountered some Italian philosophy, and I was like, and one of the things I'd been really interested in here at the Mount was like, 
um, how ideas change over time, mm -hmm. right? Because one of the hardest sells that either when I was teaching in graduate school or teaching here now, one of the like the hardest sells that you have uh, that you can give to undergraduates is like that ideas change over time. Mm -hmm. And I think that like we all sort of have kind of like a nascent mm -hmm. idea of this, right? And I think that like the last 20 years with the rise of like the internet um, and like greater dynamism and sort of like public participation in, in politics in the public sphere, right? There's, there's sort of a greater understanding that like ideas can actually change very quickly. Uh, but I don't think that people really understand the extent to which ideas can change, uh, especially ideas of the human person over the course of like 100 years, 500 years, 1,000 years, right? Oh, yeah. This is one of the um, like famous cultural historians of the 20th century said like, you know, if you did an intellectual history, like a history of ideas about cats mm -hmm. from like the beginning of time to now, like cats are pretty static, right? The, the intellectual history of cats, cats are not like doing, the cats are not like reconceiving notions of cathood. Fairly uh, clear boundaries to that concept, yes. Exactly, right? Uh, whereas if you do that for like the human person, mm -hmm. you know, within 30 years, there's like, there, you know, all new notions all the time, right? Into like ideas, human ideas are always changing. And if you track yeah. how ideas change, you track how human beings change, uh, which is just really right. fascinating. So when I when I went to do my doctoral work, like I wanted to make sure that I was doing something that tracked like both how things sort of change over time, yeah. and especially in Italy, right? He's mm -hmm. like, go and study in Italy. But also that I was tracking ideas, right? Because this was something yeah. I really fell in love with during my time here. Um, and that's what I'm most interested in. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I remember learning back in my, my research days that uh, my doctoral research day, Lord Acton, I think, had assembled 200 different definitions of freedom. Yeah. You just want to look at freedom, something as simple as freedom, something as sort of close to our, our hearts and our political consciousness as freedom. You, you really, until you get a historical sense, you don't really have any clear idea what, what you're talking about, oh what, the, what the antecedents are. Now, we have people here at the Mount who do intellectual history, yeah. right? A history of ideas. Jimmy Genusis is a, a name that comes to, mm -hmm. comes to mind as well. Uh, what was your focus on in your doctoral research then at, at Chicago? You mentioned Plato was relevant to it. Oh, yes. So where, where did that come so in? So I did the intellectual history of virtue. So basically oh, within... Okay. Um, the one of the things I was really interested in when I studied in undergrad was Machiavelli, right? Mm -hmm. And the sort of and and view two, view two exactly, and you know, uh, uh, ends justifying means and consequentialism was mm -hmm. like the. I mean, this is uh, the modern term that we've applied backwards to Machiavelli, um, but you know, the idea that what makes an action right is you know its consequences, not the sort of means taken in the middle, right? Right. Uh, and this was, like, very fascinating to me because, uh, like, and, and JP2 picks this up, like, it's everywhere, right? We're all a little consequentialists, whether we know it or not. That seems to be in the, in, in the air, right? As I think, Flannery O'Connor, I think, said this about nihilism. Oh, it's, yes. You know, it's in the atmosphere. By the time you re recognize it and look for it, it's already in every cell of your body. Well, and the fascinating thing is that consequentialism and nihilism, like, are fundamentally, like, the same thing, right? right. There's mm -hmm. no actual internal substantial value to the thing itself. You're always using it as an instrument yeah. for, for some further gain that's self-dictated, right? Right. Um, right. It, it seems that there, there is almost a kind of, there, there's a change in the human person, yeah. right? It's, it's really what it's deep at. It, there, there's, this is something that's, that's been close to close to writing project I've been working on great. lately, is this, this is almost a kind of maddening self-consciousness to the modern self. And yes. it, it can't really shut itself off. It, yes. If you've ever had this sort of experience, people have had this experience themselves, not being able to turn off your, your reflective self-consciousness and simply live yeah. to, to enjoy life. That's something characteristic of a certain type of, you know, what, you know, what Philip Reef would call you know, kind of a third world self yeah. that, that that's, that's ultimately self-annihilating but so so did you you wrote about virtue the history of the idea, I did. idea of virtue all, all across all time periods or focusing yeah uh, on... so so i was really interested in thinking about right because it seems like in the 15th century you go very quickly from like thomistic aristotelian ciceronian ideas of virtue sure being the sort of like this is the thing that like look if you want to succeed 
-hmm. in politics. You go and you get an education that studies the classics and studies Cicero and studies, you you know, Plato, who's just been recovered um, because of the fall of Constantinople and yada, yada, yada. Um, But in 50 years, 50 to 100 years, you go from like that being the sort of the the thing uh, to Machiavellian ideas of year two. Yeah. And and not like these could not be further from each other, right? Right. So what happens in those fifty years that causes yeah. this shift? And one of the one of the things I found. So I ended up focusing on how these ideas changed in the uh, court of Naples, which is a kingdom in southern Italy. Yep. It was a kingdom that was at the time like the the sort of the the major superpower in the Mediterranean. Mm-hmm. Um, which is something that we kind of forget about when we think about the Renaissance because we think, oh, you know, Florence and Michelangelo and Leonardo North, and the other, Italy, yeah. the other Ninja Turtles, right, are, right, are right. they're doing their art. But in fact, like, Naples was like the, the place that everybody thought was going to be like the coming of New Rome. Oh, wow. Um, and they were like a, a really pumping out a lot of like really brilliant thinkers. Uh, but one of the things that I found was like, in fact... The, the Neapolitan thinkers were really interested in, like, a political problem that we still have, which is this, right? So let's say, um, so their idea of what a virtuous ruler looked like was somebody who's received a classical education. Mm-hmm. Cool. Well, if you live in a period of, of time in which, like, a ruler can die from eating, like, a bad canapé or something, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Suddenly, you know, your, your virtuous ruler is dead, and now his son, who's 13 years old comes to the, you know, has to, has to sit on the throne. What do you do? Because his virtuous education isn't complete yet. He hasn't finished his education. And now suddenly you have a 13 year old on the throne who has to, you know, navigate an incredibly difficult uh, political environment. So what do you do, right? Do you cut his education short? Do you like force him to keep going with the education? And the Neapolitan thinker's solution to this problem is that it's more important to appear virtuous than uh-huh. to actually be virtuous. Like, you have to, you, like, the kid still has to complete his education in the background. Yeah. But while he's still running, like, the, the show, he's got to pretend, he's got to look competent, right? He's got to project mm-hmm. that air of virtuousness, not just to, like, the other rulers of Europe, but also to his people. Because the people look to the prince like as the as the exemplar for how they should act, yeah. right? So as the character of the prince goes, as goes the character of the people. So if you have a vicious prince, mm-hmm. you have a vicious people. So you need to project. So the prince needs to be able to project this image. It sounds sounds very Benjamin Franklin in in terms of of Renaissance Italy, though. It is right. So these are the roots of that, mm-hmm. right? So one of the things I tracked was like so. So basically, what happens? How we get Machiavelli is like there's these there's this like on the part of these, like, Orthodox Catholic thinkers on virtue, there's this set of, like, little moral compromises mm. in how they conceive of their education, which basically ends up with, like, in fact, one does not need to be virtuous in order to succeed. One simply has to appear good. And this is, like, the bedrock of, I mean, A, how we think about politics today, but, like, this this becomes the bedrock of, like, Jesuit education in the 15th century, mm-hmm. which ends up being, like, the education that everybody receives up until the 19th century. Well, that's Descartes' education, yes. Yeah, well, it's, I've, I just found this out recently. It was Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's education. Wow. Like, this is, this is mm. like, as late as that. Man. Um, so this is why, again, long answer to a short question, I'm yeah. sorry. But, uh, that's right. like, one of the, the things I was really interested in is, like, well, you know, is it, is it actually more important to be virtuous or to appear virtuous? Like, mm-hmm. this question of political expediency. Anyway, I'll cut myself off there because I could keep going on this all day. Oh, that's fantastic. Let me ask you a question, though. This is something that that comes up in my teaching of the modern period. Uh, I will sometimes make a contrast, following Roger Scruton in this, between the history of ideas and the history of philosophy. Mm -hmm. And and the difference really is whether you're immersed in history or whether you're concerned with truth. Mm -hmm. Talk about the origin of ideas. You might talk about an influential uh, figure like Luther, right, whose ideas plainly have tremendous amount of historical influence. But if you want to get down to the truth of things, you might look at his philosophically more sophisticated or more deeper thinking, Mm -hmm. less influential predecessors. Um, So I'll sometimes challenge my students early in a modern philosophy class to to write a short essay on 
the distinction between approaching the, the same texts, the same history, the same changes, at, through a history of ideas lens, where we're looking at historical factors, and through a history of philosophy lens, where we're ultimately the, the question at the end is, you know, is it true? Mm -hmm. what, 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 what's not just what's influential, but what's, what's correct? Does that come up then as you, in your role as a sort of philosophically a trained historian of ideas? Oh, yeah. Or, or maybe is this tension, as I've drawn it, a little bit exaggerated in your... Sure. I mean, I would say that, A, it absolutely comes up, right? Uh, one of the things that I actually find a little bit frustrating about contemporary, like, academic history is that this question of, like, well, are they right? Is always sort of pushed off to the side. Mm -hmm. And one of the, the lovely things about, like, being formed in the core curriculum that we have here at Mount St. Mary's uh, is that, like, from, from my first philosophy and history classes... Like, that was not the sort of bifurcation that I had, right? There was always this, like, yes, we have to examine the historical background, but then we also have to do the other thing of, like, you know, is this, like, true or not? Mm -hmm. I think that that division, with apologies to Scruton, right? I think that that division is, like, a little too modern, right? Like, it's, it's, right. it's very sort of, um, it's separating out something that's meant to be whole. Mm -hmm. Like, these two things are meant to go together. Because, of right. course, you can't understand where somebody like Luther came from in a vacuum. But you need to be, like... One of the th quotations that's been very influential on... that has come to be very influential in my time as a historian is JP2's, like, the, the first line of his pontificate, mm -hmm. right? Jesus Christ, the Redeemer of man, is at the center of the universe and of history. And if you take that seriously, mm. as he does over the course of his pontificate, that has massive historical implications. Because what this means is that you, in fact, cannot separate history from the truth. Brilliant. Um, because history, as a human experience, not just as a study, but as, like, we are all living in history... And we are all looking towards the past and towards the future. Like, our experience of this is fundamentally a pursuit of truth. Right. Which finds its center and its fullness in the person of Christ. Right? This right. history is tending eschatologically towards union with the divine, towards right. beatitude. But the, the, the ultimate question then is, and you can take it back to, to the concept of humanity, you know, is what does it mean to live as a self-reflective human person historically, Precisely. sort of in time, through time, towards the end of time, how do we combine a historical sense with a concern for truth? And in some ways, that, that's the question of the 19th century. Yes. Well, it's also the question of, like, I, th I think that Dionysius the Areopagite, or Pseudo-Dionysius, or whatever you want to call him, yeah. who's a Neoplatonic philosopher in the 12th century, I defer to my 12th-ish, 12th-ish century, mm -hmm. um, he, he really gets this down, right? He, like, he, because he describes the, the human soul as having these movements inwards and outwards, right? This sort of like, uh, you know, we have this movement of the soul outwards and then we have uh, this sort of this spiral motion back inwards. Uh, and I think that one of the things, I'm like really, this is too much of an oversimplification. But one of the things that I think he's getting at there is that our experience of living in the world and in history always leads us back toward a self-reflection at the center of which we find a uh, being that is meant for communion with God. And that self-exploration then naturally leads us back outwards to how this relationship oriented towards communion is played out over the course of time. Mm -hmm. And so these things are in fact, like this historical sense of the human person is inseparable from self-reflection, right? Because yeah. that's part of who we are, is we're historical. And that's part of who Christ is, is like when he took human flesh, mm -hmm. he entered into history. That means that time itself yeah. is something that is like beautiful and, and taken up and perfected by Christ. So anyway, all that is to say, I think that this bifurcation is sort of artificial yeah. and, and at best and very dangerous at worst. Right. Now, this is when, when I, in, in this class, I usually go on to contrast Scruton's approach to history to Gilson's, right. for example. And it's to take some, somebody who takes the history of philosophy seriously without abandoning a concern for truth. 
And then the question becomes, you know, what what does it mean to say that philosophy has a history, that human thought, human reason in its own perspective? It, it sounds like as though, you know, we can't talk about the human without talking about the historical. Mm -hmm. And it seems like, you know, at the deepest, most profound level, we can't talk about the historical without talking about Christ. Yes. And so now we're looking like, this is feeling more like my studies of Pascal and of Kierkegaard and other thinkers where you say, look, you, you can't do a sort of secular, religiously neutral version of this. You can't take the Christ out of Pascal yeah. and still have Pascal make any sense whatsoever. Yeah. So fr from a secular perspective, either you're going to dismiss him as a theologizer or you take him seriously and you say, here's the case that these things all hang together and, and you ultimately can't do one without another. That argues for a certain kind of intellectual identity, maybe the practice of the intellect, of rigorous intellectual work at a certain type of institution within a certain kind of curriculum. Yeah. Which brings me back around to something else I wanted to ask you about, which is how you see all these factors coming uh, into play in your teaching. Sure. In the core curriculum, you're teaching freshmen and sophomores, um, people who are completely new, and of course also there are people coming of age in the 2020s and who are, who are now thinking about these same topics, topics that you've thought of and explored as a specialist, now you're approaching them maybe through a generalist lens as, as part of an overall curriculum. How has that come to play then in, in your teaching and your sort of struggling with the, the particulars of pedagogy sure. here and now? Yeah, so one of the things that, I mean, the... <laughs> At the beginning, you described after reading off my thing that I'm a Renaissance man. I don't know that that's. I, I think that that's a very charitable read. I think another read is that like I have no idea, like what I want to do uh, in in the sense of like, I, specialism is always something I've really struggled with, because you kind of need to have the tension between the sort of like vertical delving deeply into a thing to know it better, mm -hmm. right, and the horizontal of like. How does this, in fact, shape my ability to be in relationship with others and to lead them closer to the truth? Right. right? One of the things that I find really valuable about approaching these topics philosophically and approaching these topics, like, Catholically, right? Right. Is that at the root of the exploration of the intellectual tradition that we are steeped in is a love right mm -hmm. that in order for in order for us to be able to start answering like the big questions of the intellectual history of the west one needs to do it as an amateur right right as a and like in the root sense amateur as a lover right mm -hmm. Oh, you, very you, good. You take up these these questions, um, questions like what does it mean to be human? Which again we explore, like that's the central question of the core curriculum here. Like that we take up these questions because at the root of it there is something within us that A in the presence of these questions presents us with wonder, mm -hmm. right? That, like, we have to respond to this with wonder. This is something to, like, to contemplate and to receive with this, with this like, awe. Right, almost, very, right? very, very John Paul II insight. But also that, like, that receiving these questions with wonder doesn't mean that we treat them as we would, like, a butterfly collector behind glass, mm -hmm. right? So, you know, the, you, what, you, okay, here's my collection of butterflies, and I've got them all pinned up, and look at my collection. Yeah. Like, it... it if we're, if we're really responding to these questions as a lover would, I mean, if you think about the experience of the lover and the beloved, mm -hmm. right, there's always a wonder there on, on the, the, the part of the lover, right, where right. it's like, this is, you're for me? How is this possible? Right. You're so amazing. Right, right. Like, Only the lover sings, writes Joseph Pieper, yeah. Precisely, yeah. right? And there's that, that sort of like contemplative posture that one adopts towards the beloved right. but there's also like there's an active side to that right because if you're just contemplating the beloved right, right. Th there's a whole aspect there of like no 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 you're wonderful but there's also something about you that's for me in a yeah. mysterious way right like i can see this in a way that very mm -hmm. mysteriously like nobody else can yeah and one of the things that I think is really wonderful about teaching students, and especially about teaching students here, I mean, this is, 
uh, this may be going off track a little bit too much, but when I was teaching in graduate school, especially at a place like U Chicago, which is, you know, it's near Chicago, it's the Ivy of the Midwest, and mm-hmm. da da da. And it's an incredible institution, and it provided me with an insane number of opportunities. Oh, absolutely. Um, and there's, there's wonderful people there. But when I was teaching there, one of the things I encountered was that, like, students would come in and they would have their, I, there's like these, their answers to these big questions already kind of figured out. Mm-hmm. Um, and when they would sort of come face to face with like different answers or challenging answers, there would sort of be like a shutting down, right? Where it's mm-hmm. like, well, kind of, who are you to tell me that the, the way that I'm thinking about the world is, is wrong? Yeah. Whereas if you're approaching, if you're approaching those questions as I think our students here at the Mount are, namely with like, whether they know it or not, a sort of posture of humility, mm-hmm. right? My no, my ideas of the world are not yet fully formed. And I just want to sort of know what's there. Because I think in their hearts, just like with every human person, there's this desire for for the truth and that the, the truth can, only the truth can sate that. Right. That adopting that position of of humility opens them up to being able to respond to these questions as a lover would, mm-hmm. right? Oh, that's Wa- very good, yeah. Wanting to, wanting to find out the answers, not because the answers will, like, will give them, like, the checkbox of, okay, I've solved everything, mm-hmm. but because, like, it will draw them more deeply into the mystery of, like, well, what does this mean? What does this mean that I'm in relationship with the truth, yeah. right? Which is, which is something that you can never, like, that, that's a question that, I mean, you and I ask right after, you know, decades of, of work in academia every single day. Yeah, this is, this is uh, something that comes up in my own teaching of Plato to, to again, freshmen usually. Uh, it, it, it's a prese- I'll present this as the negative moment of the Socratic dialectic, yes. right? which is the, the, the discovery of humility. Until you have that, nothing else that you know is, is worthwhile. Yeah. So the first thing to learn is the truth about yourself. And then to awaken the hungering for truth in yourself. Yes. But repeatedly in the early Socratic dialogues, you find the person who's not quite ready because he hasn't achieved the, the proper attitude of humility and unknowing wonder towards the topic at hand. So, 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 so to clear away the wrong opinions first is also to improve the self-understanding. Precisely. Of the, 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 who, who is at first the patient and then later the sort of active assistant in his in his escape from the cave. Well, and to I mean not to keep bringing up JP too, but he like one of the things he builds out in several of his encyclicals is like man exists in a threefold relationship, right? He exists in himself. Mm-hmm. That's the sort of relationship that he becomes perhaps aware of like most quickly, right? Mm-hmm. Is this like there's a, there's this interiority of self, right? This like self position the self possession. Right. And then he realizes that like he is not he didn't create himself, right? He is not sort of like uh, ex mente, like self-creating this like little monad or whatever. Right. Um, he's come from another. And that he, he sort of did nothing to earn his existence, right? His existence is, is just from another it's as, gratuitous. as yeah, a yeah. gift. It's received, precisely. It's received. So you have to recognize yourself as a receiver of, of what you are. Exactly. Well, and then that sort of naturally falls, like, leads to the third relationship, which is this. Like, the more you contemplate, like, that interior relationship, the more you realize that you can only find who you really are when you give yourself away entirely to another. Mm -hmm. Um, Make a complete and total gift of self. Uh, And I think that one of the, to circle back around to the original pedagogy question... This is something that JP2 and Gaudium et Spes, which is the constitution of the Second Vatican Council, says is like, this is, this is what the purpose of man is, is to make this complete and total self-gift with the knowledge of the sort of uh, uh, self-possession and being from another. Right. Um, so our students want to do that, whether they know it or not initially. They want to make that self-gift. Right. So our job as teachers is to get them to discover that love that they already have and to enable them through a greater understanding of self and where they come from and what the purpose of their life is, their lives are mm-hmm. to be able to make that self-gift 
both to the truth ultimately and to at least for most to to others in their daily lives right right, right. of course of course you can't i've said this before in a previous uh, episode you can't give away what you don't have yes right so the first thing to, is is to have this kind of self-knowledge and self-possession let me ask you one more question, if I could, related to the others, maybe sort of embracing them all. Sure. About the the, the relative priority of the specialist and the generalist mm. in your intellectual identity. You have been both. I mean, you've, you've done a PhD, and one doesn't do a PhD in a general topic. One one focuses in sharply and, and meets the standards of yeah. uh, a very discreet academic community. And yet teaching, especially teaching, undergraduate teaching early in the core, Right, you're working as a generalist. I'm thinking here of something I've spoken with you about with you before. My my, my current interest in in the life of Auguste Comte, of course, the, the founder of positivism and founder of sociology, uh, and his profound belief that although political economy is useful, although we need all sorts of philosophical work uh, and specialist work to be done that the regeneration of society will come through the work of the generalists doing philosophical work, creating a new synthesis. Yes. And so there's this idea out here, and I think of myself as being mainly a generalist, certainly in my teaching, and yet we also exist within institutions, sort of academia at large, in which the, the, the reward structures and the, the incentives and prestige seem to be assigned to the more highly specialized fields, both in the sciences and in the humanities. What, what's been your experience the past decade or so of the dynamic between being a generalist and being a specialist and, and finding the intellectual rewards at both levels? Sure. I mean, I think that properly construed, the relationship between the generalist and the specialist is reflective of like the classic tension between the universal and the particular, mm -hmm. which finds it's like, especially in the life of the mind, finds its fullness when we see these through the light th through the lens of that which we are made for namely beatitude life in heaven sainthood life with christ right there is nothing more specialized nothing more particular than the relationship that we have with christ like we are made each of us in his image and likeness uniquely mm -hmm. right and yet if we don't share that relationship with others like it's it's all going to go fallow, right? Yeah. So I I guess that's a that's a very like high fluting answer. Let me like root it in the concrete a little bit more. Sure. One of the things that I've found is that if I'm doing my specialized work right, that is always going to bear greater fruit when I do my generalist teaching. Yeah. Uh and the the more that I I enter into like that generalist teaching, uh with that sort of like that that the love of the amateur that we were just talking about, mm -hmm. the more my specialist work is enriched, right? Yeah. So it's this sort of dynamic interplay, kind of with, with what we were talking about about Dionysius, right? Of this going at this like exitus and the reditus, right? You are going out and you are sharing with others, and then you are returning to the self, and then you are, mm -hmm. you know, you're always going back and forth, and at the center of that should be Christ. Uh, that is the sort of ultimate contextualizing fact yeah. of, of, I mean, that, that's, if you have that, you have the possibility of the, the full context of a healthy self, a healthy institution, a healthy intellectual life, and healthy relations in society. And part of what I'm thinking of in terms of the split between these may be symptoms of a deeply unhealthy society and unhealthy intellectual life. Well, exactly. Like, if, you, if you're doing this exitus and this reditus for the sake of, like, if your specialized, quote-unquote, work is for the sake of these, you know, these prestige things, mm -hmm. right, uh, then you're not actually pursuing your specialized whatever for its own sake, right? You're pursuing it for something else. Yeah. You're instrumentalizing the truth. Um, right. You're using it as, to go back to Machiavelli, a means to an end. So that means that when you 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 do your exodus and you try and go to your your generalist teaching, mm -hmm. you're probably not going to have a bunch of like fruit that has been born that you can bring up to that. And then when you return to your specialized work, it's just going to create this like cycle of aridity, right? Uh, this like nothing. I, I, I know there are, there are uh, academic novels that are written about just precisely such characters. Yes. Right. Yeah. So. Thank you. Uh, let me ask you the last question sure. of the show. Do you have any advice for prospective philosophy majors or freshmen, sophomores thinking about 
you know, is, is, is philosophy worth risking a minor or a, or a double major on? Any, any thoughts now, both either as a teacher or as somebody who's gone through and is now, you know, almost a decade beyond uh, graduation at, from, at, from your bachelor's institution? Sure. I would have three pieces of advice. They're very simple. The first is, if you're, if you're concerned about this as a risk, don't conceive of it as a risk. Like, philosophy, and I can, I can say this with all honesty, because it happened to me. Teaching philosophy, sorry, studying philosophy will make you happier. It will make you happier. It will also make you in some ways sadder, right, insofar as it will reveal to you things about yourself that perhaps you wish had stayed veiled. But in the end, that will open up, like, gateways towards a greater and deeper happiness than you would have ever thought possible. So that's, that's the first piece of advice. The second piece of advice is, if you want to study philosophy well, go look at the world. Go outside. Mm -hmm. Look at a tree. Go to a farm. Touch like, grass. Be yes. in the world. Touch grass, precisely. Yeah. Be in the world. Look at, what, like, look at what is. Because the longer and the more intensely you look at what is, mm -hmm. the more you realize the mystery of the being of all things. Mm -hmm. Right. There is no way if you are a if you are a true philosopher, you will never be bored because being is inexhaustible. Mm -hmm. And if if you find yourself becoming stuck, go out and reacquaint yourself with being because it is mysterious and it's beautiful. Great advice. Um, and the third thing is like very concretely go to adoration, receive whole communion every day, mm -hmm. go to confession every week. Put yourself in, in, in before the face of truth, mm -hmm. and you will reap multitudes. Go to church. Very, very Pascalian uh, conclusion then. Indeed, as well. The root of the intellectual life is is being in right order prior to engaging in it. Yes. Right? So, so that's, that's well you, said. You might say also, yeah, you can't you can't solve intellectually problems that that precede yeah the the intellectual life. So. Yeah. Thank you very much, John Paul. My guest today has been Dr. John Paul Heil, a PhD in history and a Mount Core Fellow here at Mount St. Mary's University. Uh, I'm very grateful for your time here. Pleased to be Thanks here. so much. Thank you. All right. Goodbye. Thank you for listening to Life After Philosophy. If you enjoyed the podcast, please rate it five stars and share this episode with a friend. I appreciate your support.